May 28, 1864, Veracruz, Mexico. 101 guns ring out across the harbor, saluting the approaching Austrian ship Novara. On her deck stands Emperor Maximilian I and Empress Carlotta. They scan the coast of their new empire, and no one is there. The first person to greet the new imperial couple is the admiral of the nearby French squadron, who upon boarding their ship chastises the emperor for docking in the most contagious part of the port. Yellow fever has recently run through this port. This is the start of Maximilian's reign. Hello, and welcome back to History in Focus, your one-stop shop for the stuff they didn't teach you in school. Today, we'll be focusing on part two of the short-lived Second Mexican Empire and its impact on the history of Mexico. Just remember to give freedom a ring and hit that subscribe button. After disembarking, the new imperial couple was finally greeted by their host, Juan Almonte Ramirez. Part of the Regency government of Mexico, Almonte had been the former minister of war to the conservative Mexican government. The trip to the capital was rough, to say the least. There was no railroad that went to Mexico City, so the journey had to be completed on rail and then carriage through rickety and incomplete roads. They would finally reach the capital on June 12th. It was time for the real work to begin. After about a week's worth of balls and celebrations, that is. This would become a common theme during the Empire. Anyway, Maximilian sought to create a modern, liberal government once he got to work. He wanted his empire to be supported by all of the people, not just the landed aristocrats and his divine right to rule. However, he would still have to win most of his new empire as only the central states of Mexico had recognized his reign or were occupied by French soldiers. President Juarez and his supporters were in Monterrey Nuevo León, on the border of the United States. And there were other problems as well. Mexico was severely in debt, even more than before this expedition had begun. Under the Treaty of Miramar that Maximilian had signed, Mexico had to pay for the French army protecting it, but the Mexican government didn't make nearly enough money to pay for the cost of governing, let alone an army, and the loan the French had given them wasn't going to last forever. Maximilian, however, seemed more interested in designing his imperial residence. Despite this, the emperor did begin to form his government, and immediately began to alienate the conservatives that helped put him in power, by smartly inviting and appointing moderate liberals to his cabinet. On the military front, the French and their Mexican allies were consistently winning battles against the Republicans, and yet he continued to make mistakes in foreign and domestic diplomacy. On December 27th, he decreed freedom of worship in Mexico and the sale of the church property. This royally ticked off the conservative clergy, as well as the recently arrived ambassador from the Pope. He then went on to disband the Mexican army, fearing it was more loyal to conservatives than to him. Despite this, he also passed some of the most liberal policies anywhere in the world, including, but not limited to, limiting the working hours, requiring lunch breaks, regulating child labor, and restoring land ownership to indigenous peoples. Even Carlotta had a native woman as a lady-in-waiting. Decrees were also printed in Nahuatl, the native language of the Aztecs. However, most of these went nowhere, and they were rarely executed or enforced. All the while, the debt clock went up, and the balls continued to happen. Meanwhile, Napoleon III continued to become more exasperated at his protege's lack of effort. By 1865, it became clear that this war was not going to be winnable without more French involvement, that Napoleon was not eager to provide. Despite this, the French did manage to capture Juarez's government's new capital in Chihuahua, but once again, Juarez escaped and relocated even closer to the U.S. border, in a town that would one day be known as Ciudad Juarez. It all started to crumble by 1866. With the Civil War over, General Ulysses S. Grant was pressuring President Johnson to act and throw the French out. Fearing war and faced with what was becoming an increasingly unpopular policy, Napoleon III informed Maximilian that the French army would leave at the end of 1867. By the middle of 1866, things continued to turn south for Maximilian, and by June, he was contemplating abdication. His wife managed to talk him out of it and decided she would travel to Europe to convince Napoleon III, Belgium, and Austria to help their empire. Her efforts would be fruitless, however, and she began experiencing extreme bouts of mental illness, including paranoia, anxiety, and nightmares. At one point, she became convinced that her entire entourage was out to kill her and tried to have them all arrested. She would eventually be combined to Castle Miramare for the time being. Upon hearing the news of Carlotta, Maximilian was determined to abdicate, but only if he could do so honorably and with certain conditions met. Naturally, these conditions were not met, and Napoleon was now ordering the French army to leave by March of 1867. They left Mexico City in February of that year. 
Maximilian himself would abandon the capital with what remained of his supporters on February 13, 1867, and would hole up in the city of Querétaro. Maximilian was then surrounded by Republican armies on March 5th, starting a siege that would last until May 15th, when a traitorous officer opened the gates for the Republicans, leading to Maximilian's capture. He was naturally found guilty on June 16th, and surprisingly considering how other heads of state had been treated in the past, sentenced to death by firing squad. Ultimately, Benito Juarez believed that without executing Maximilian and his captured conspirators, his rule and government would not be taken seriously. This sentence was carried out on June 19th. In the morning, Maximilian and two others were led out to a spot in front of a wall. In the traditions of other soon-to-be-executed monarchs, Maximilian gave each man in the firing squad a gold coin and asked them to aim for his heart. His last words were, I forgive everyone, and I ask everyone to forgive me. May my blood, which is about to be spilled, and the bloodshed which has been experienced in my new motherland, long live Mexico, long live its independence. Then shots rang out. Maximilian I, Emperor of Mexico, was dead, and the Second Mexican Empire was over. Empress Carlotta would die in 1927, a depressed and very likely insane woman. The legacy of the Second Mexican Empire is mixed. As Maximilian attempted to speed up the industrialization of Mexico with railroads and better infrastructure, the constant fighting slowed this progress. Despite trying to recognize the indigenous peoples of Mexico, Maximilian was often thwarted by weak or unwilling officials. It was supposed to be a government of stability and unity, but instead brought further instability and bloodshed. Soon after the end of the empire, Mexico would find itself under the control of a military dictatorship, led by Porfirio Diaz in 1876, and then another revolution that lasted from 1910 to 1920. While noble in his intentions, Maximilian was installed in the most illegitimate fashion. Perhaps his reign would have been longer and more stable had he done more to fix Mexico's problems. He had been led astray in his understanding of the situation before he became emperor, but ultimately, the choice to take the throne and thus his grave was his. If you enjoyed this week's content, please subscribe for future videos. Let us know what you thought in the comments below and what you would like us to cover next.